Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first uh, webinar from Inoco. My name is Hélène Sore. I'm the head of marketing and co-founder of Inoco, and I will be the moderator of this uh, webinar today. So you should see our screen. The topic of today is uh, the future is sustainable, leading the way in the F&B industry. So we are going to go, first of all, I will provide a quick overview on the importance of sustainability in the F&B industry. We will then talk about trends, challenges, and most importantly, about opportunities and solutions existing out there. We will gain a um, very good insight from a grocery retailer, and we will finish with an open discussion and a QA. and a So to everyone now in the chat, uh, please, any question you have, feel free to just ask your question in the chat. The chat is already open. We will, at the end of the discussion, we will review some of the question and just ask the audience. If you have a question in particular to one of our speaker, feel free to also address that question to the speaker, okay? Um, yes, so without any further ado, I would like to introduce you our three speakers. So first speaker is Franz van der Schottbrugge. Uh, he's director of Agile Program Management at Publicis Sapient. Publicis Sapient is a digital consulting firm that helps businesses build and create uh, customer-centric experiences. We also have Markus Linde, is the founder and CEO at Inoco. Inoco is a, a retail solution that helps grocery retailers, F&B brands, and suppliers to assess and optimize the environmental impact of their entire assortment along the value chain. And uh, last but not least, we have Manuel Linder, and they are absolutely not connected, so they are not brother, but they have the same last name. Uh, Manuel is a senior digital strategist and lead innovation manager at Migro. Uh, Migro is actually the largest uh, grocery retailer in Switzerland. And uh, more interestingly, they are also leading the way in terms of sustainability. So. We are super thrilled to have uh, you three here today. And uh, before asking the first question, I will just maybe uh, give a quick overview uh, on why are we actually today talking about food and uh, sustainability. So our food consumption has major impact on the planet and on ourselves. 70% of biodiversity loss on land is actually due to what we eat. 34% of global greenhouse gas emissions also come from our food system. And we know that what we eat can have also major impact on our health. So if we want to talk about tackling climate crisis, we have to talk about food systems and sustainability. So my first question will go to you, Franz. You are uh, talking to a lot of clients, a lot of retailers. You also have quite some insights from the customer perspective. So I would like to ask you, what trends do you see which are related to sustainability? What trend do you see uh, happening at the moment? What, what do you hear from your clients? Yeah, thank you, Helene. Thank you for the introduction and the and the invite. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's uh, a topic close to my heart. Before um, Publish Sapient, I was working at Tesco, and you may remember discussions at the time that were happening about what do we communicate with consumers on uh, fat, saturated fats, uh, sugar, salt content, etc. And the battle that was in the retail sector, how to communicate it, and everyone started to communicate their own thing. Uh, and the consumer, of course, was the one that lost. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, we had um, uh, then a, a period where people had to communicate on allergy. So I think, again, it is vital uh, from to look at the customer and the consumer perspective, first of all. So what can corporates, retailers tell consumers and how can they communicate them with in a consistent and, and, and comparative way. So they want to see visibility, but they want to understand it and they want to see visibility in a consistent manner. Um, in, in this perspective, 
um, younger shoppers, of course, are called out that they go more on the barricades. But uh, I'm not a, a spring chicken anymore. But believe me, uh, I want it just as much. Uh, I won't be on the barricades, but I will try to uh, help from whatever I can do. Um, and I think in most instances, people are really prepared, even in this economic difficult climate, to, to pay for the right products or select the right products. From a corporate perspective, and this is where things can come together quite nicely, um, is that there's a huge pressure now on corporates uh, for their sustainability and ESG reporting. The um, clearly the net zero uh, targets for 2030. In 2024, there will be um, more stricter ESG rules as well. So there is a, a huge legal pressure on, on corporates uh, to uh, to apply with new leg legislations. And it could even be a threat to companies for their continuity if they don't. So that's a bit of the scene setting for both consumers and corporates and how they can find each other. Um, and then the way is, if we can go to the next slide, please, is um, so what are the challenges and the opportunities? Because I think we always look not only to address challenges, but also then open a window for opportunities. And, and there are many in this respect, because it, it shouldn't be a threat. It should be always an opportunity, and it should help corporates to grow over time and work with the consumers. Because ultimately, if a retailer doesn't have a good relationship with its consumers, there are plenty of others next door to go to. So. It is, first of all, very important to understand for the retailer what is important to their customers and how do they want to be communicated with and in what means. And I think uh, you may have some uh, examples later, Marcus, but just not to think about labeling, but to think about till receipts, to think about online. So that communication needs to be omnichannel, needs to be consistent. Um, and that, so the opportunity is then one is to engage with them and, and really involve them in what you want to show them and how they want to see it and, and create a baseline. And I think what is important is that there is a baseline that is accepted by the industry. Uh, and it's very good to see the initiatives of Migro are already, and, and there will be others, but ultimately we need to bring it together and and, and we also need to bring it in line with ESG reporting. Uh, sustainability and supply chain are almost intrinsically linked um, because a lot of the data will come out of the supply chain. And, and what retailers need to look out for is that they get the right data and, and the right information. We've seen in the press already quite a few comments on greenwashing to show <laughs> probably better then what, what you really do, and, and that needs to change. And that's a challenge because it's not easy to bring all that data together and even at individual product level, but it, it needs to get there. And I think setting what you normally use in Agile, a, a minimum viable product. So what is the first step you can do and then build on that? But the same will apply for ESG reporting. First, get your first reporting right and then engage in continuous improvement. So from our perspective, we see that this is an opportunity to, for businesses to communicate with new customers on one end or with their existing customers and create more loyalty and for themselves to get the foundations for their each ESG reporting right. Okay. Sorry, a long answer for, <laughs> for a small no, question. But very, <laughs> very interesting. Um, so it's really great to see. So what are the challenges? And I have the feeling from what you said that there are quite some challenges, but also even more interesting, there are also quite a lot of opportunities there for retailers. So my logical question would be uh, to you, Marcus, how can retailers today 
tackle those challenges, but also at the same time seize the opportunities from those challenges? What can they do? Yeah, very good question. I think the very uh, interesting aspect of the challenge is that a very part, a very large part of the challenge is out of the direct control of the retailers. Because if we look at the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, if we look at the biodiversity impact, if we look at the health implications of the products uh, the, the retailers are selling, um, the very, very large part of the challenge or the very large part of the greenhouse gas emissions, for example, arise out of the product. So it's not how they heat their stores, how they transport their products, but it's really how the ingredients uh, of the products which they are selling have been produced and what kind of ingredients they are selling. So it's about the land use that was involved in the production. It's about the agricultural stage and the emissions that are arising there. But uh, it doesn't only have a, the large impact from a climate perspective, but also if you look at other dimensions, like for example, social impact, or if you look at biodiversity. So uh, really the message is to tackle the challenge as a retailer, obviously you need to start you know, within your uh, own uh, controlled environment and many are, are taking initiatives there and are on a good path. But it's really key to look at the products because the, the products is where retailers really have uh, the biggest impact. That's what we want to try to say with this slide. And they also have a huge opportunity because retailers, grocery retailers are really uniquely positioned to support the decarbonizations of their suppliers and producers upstream, as well as really supporting their consumers downstream to meet to, to basically adopt a more sustainable and healthier diet and thereby also contributing to achieving those goals and lowering the overall impact of the retailers. If we move on to the next slide, I think um, the steps that retailers need to take is really uh, a later foundation, which is basically they have to assess where they are standing at the moment with their products. Uh, obviously, at the moment, carbon is very much on top of mind. So more and more retailers are committing to science-based targets, which is really great. Uh, but I think we should also really acknowledge that um, more and more impact dimensions, such as animal welfare, such as nutrition and health, such as social, will be on top of the agenda very, very soon. And um, therefore, we definitely recommend retailers to obviously focus on carbon now in the first step, but at the same time, already later foundations that are needed to then also assess products on these other impact uh, dimensions on these other categories. So assess is definitely the first step um, to know where they're standing. Uh, a second very important step is to really start into communicating openly to the consumers, um, you know, what is the impact of the product? What's the carbon footprint? What's the biodiversity impact? What's the social impact? How is it doing from a health perspective? And really inviting the consumers thereby by enabling and empowering the consumers to really choose in a way that's better for themselves and better for the planet and better for other people. So becoming transparent and communicating is a very important second step. Um, the third step in my, in my opinion has to be really to go beyond pure communication and uh, I call it really engage with the consumers. So leverage, for example, content, nudging, gamification, such as, for example, climate um, receipts or, you know, offering them challenges where you invite them to buy certain uh, more environmental friendly products that month and reward them, really engage them, make it fun to try out new things and to really break those existing behaviors that are so deeply ingrained into people's uh, everyday lives. So you, it's not just enough to just simply provide information and to simply start with labeling, for example, on the products or also on the digital means, but you really need to engage with them, provide them content and uh, provide strong incentives to kind of try out new things. And uh, last but not least is to then really work on the optimization of the own assortment. So on a product level, on a product category level, on a supplier level, look at what are the biggest levers? How can I maybe replace certain ingredients or the country of origin of a certain ingredient? Or how can I shift towards certified ingredients and thereby really make progress uh, towards my uh, goals, be it climate, be it uh, social, be it whatever. 
Um, and yeah, uh, why, as mentioned already earlier, I think it's really key to keep on top of mind that climate is just the beginning, but we will see a very similar journey going on for other impact topics such as animal welfare. Let's just think about the deforestation um, law that's uh, currently put in place on the European level. There's lots of these topics coming up and simply consumers want much more transparency. They want to know how their products have been produced, what the impact of that is. And you really need to set up basically the infrastructure that allows you to answer their questions. Um, yeah, that's basically, um, I think, the steps that uh, retailers, in my opinion, should take at this point. Perfect. Thank you, Marcus. I think super, super interesting to see those insights and to see that there are already uh, solutions existing out there for uh, grocery retailers that also some of the solution even are, are quite detailed. So not only looking at one dimension, but looking at different dimension and that you have really simple steps to go uh, along the sustainability journey. So Manuel, you work uh, for a retailer and one retailer which is very big and it's already quite advanced in sustainability. So you heard what Marcus said. Does that resonate with you? What is Micro actually doing with sustainability? Does can you share with us a little bit um, on on uh, on your journey? Yes, of course. Can you hear me well? Is that okay? Yes. So many thanks for inviting me to uh, this webinar. I'm very much uh, looking forward to it. I will share some things that we did in, uh, in Migros. So it very well resonates what my previous speakers has uh, told already. You see here the AMP check. It's not that old that we have this label on our product. So we have around 3000 products in the stores that have a physical label like that. The star rating that you see here on this Heidi Folram bottle. And what you see here is uh, one thing that we really try to make it very simple. You see here animal welfare and climate. So there is a star rating, which is from one to five stars. And this is really something we learned that it has to be very, very simple. Uh, it is a this is also the unbalance we have. We have a very much complex topic, but on the other hand, we need to simple transport it. That is also the learning that we that we had on these uh, two dimensions that we have at the moment. And for sure, there will be also, as Marcus told, their biodiversity packaging. All of all of this dimension uh, needs needs to grow. But it's really in this balance to how you can engage and. It's also something personal for all of us. Where is, for example, is three stars for yourself enough or do you need like five stars? Or So this is um, something which goes really personal and which is very interesting. You see at by the end of 2025, uh, we try to have a lot of the star rating on our package. You need to know that 80% of our products, which is in a, in a micro supermarket is a private label. So we can do that very much easily, but we have also started to grow that much more up. And the simple question could also be, why is there no QR code? I think that in the future, this, this will be a case that we have more, much more future information was just to, to get things started. So maybe you can go on one slide more, please. So here you also see how that could be involved in the future. We are, this is a, a mock-up that we do. So this is not the final thing. This is just to get you a little bit of sense where we're thinking. So the big thing is really to engage with the customer. How can we much more um, get into this, tell a story, um, get future details. And you see that we have one thing, we try to look back together with the consumers. What is the history? What was your shopping basket? Because we have this loyalty program, maybe you know it, Cumulus, where we have 4 million households in Switzerland. We can very much looking into your existing uh, historical data. So we can say how, yeah, how, how green was your basket? We would love to look then ahead together. So what could be alternatives? How could the consumer increase uh, or compensate even their actual shopping basket? And also that you can control it. The idea is that you, for example, can say, I would not like to have any products which be flown to Switzerland or I want climate contribution by default. So things like that, we really try to engage the consumers. We need to have the consumers. We cannot at our own 
just bring down the whole supply chain to meet the uh, science-based targets. We need to engage with the consumers to bring this down. And this will be a, a balance between uh, simplicity and complexity. Maybe you can go one, one more on that. And to bring that on my uh, last slide on that is where, where do we see the business value? This is also a slide we discuss a lot with our management, of course, because at the end, it has to fit in, in certain buckets, of course. So there is, we think customer loyalty is a very, very big point. We see the need is here. We see a, a lot of changing in that thinking. And it is really fulfilling a relevant customer need. We can say that from thousands of uh, surveys we do, of interviews, of of testing that out. On the middle thing, this is one of my main topics because at the end, sustainability is a data game. We need a lot of data. We need to enrich um, uh, this digital customer twin. We also call it the digital product twin. So we need from one product, if you have like, a, like this bottle or you have an apple or whatever you have from the production till it's in the shelf, we need to know exactly for this product, how was the whole value chain. So it helps us clearly to enrich with data. And the last one, of course, is the strategic fit transparency, uh, which, which we need. So we see there this, um, this uh, buckets to go, but I would clearly say to have it as a twin, to have the data, that's a, a huge thing to, to get into it. So uh, I really can resonate with, uh, with all this thinking and there uh, maybe I can then share it in the future webinar, some, some insights on that. <laughs> thank you, Manuel. I mean, it's so first of all, thank you for being also transparent to us and sharing what Migro is doing. Uh, it's also, also good to see that there is, you, that Migro is also reaping the benefit uh, of the sustainable transformation. So I think it's also a hope for all the retailers and listening to us it's not only about cost, there's also quite some benefits, attracting younger customer, uh, maybe shifting product to a uh, higher margin product, uh, getting more data. So this is cool. So I think right now we have touched a little bit on the surface um, of the problem, the solution and some insights. I would love to go a little bit more um, in detail. And my question would go to you, Marcus, what uh, would be the first step that a retailer can do in order to lower uh, the impact of their product? Are they any low hanging fruits? Um, yeah, I think definitely they are low hanging fruits. So I see in total basically four levers that grocery retailers and as well partially food and beverage brands um, uh, really can take. I mean, one very important step is obviously to reduce food waste. Um, that's something where retailers have a lot of uh, a, a big, big lever, not only within their own um, kind of, you know, stores and their own facilities, but also when it comes to helping consumers to reduce food waste, and that's a big lever. Uh, the second big lever is definitely to leverage the power they have with their own private label brands to really move ahead and to make sure that um, they set themselves targets. So I think the very first step needs to be setting yourself targets in terms of carbon, in terms of food waste, in terms of animal welfare, as more and more retailers are actually doing, assessing the baseline, but then also really assign goals towards those big levers. So again, the first level would be food waste. The second level would be certainly the private labor brands, where yeah, retailers have a huge, huge, huge uh, possibility to uh, move into the right direction. But um, let's not forget, retailers also have, yeah, quite some influence when it comes to third-party brands. So I think you really need to work with uh, carrot and stick there when it comes to the third-party brand um, product. And there are a couple of great ways how you can really step-by-step, -step, yeah, put a bit more pressure onto the brands to make sure that they take sustainability of their product serious and that they really help the retailers to achieve their goals by, for example, ask, uh, assessing the impact of products before they are listed or by, for example, um, every year kicking out a certain amount of products, a certain percentage of products where more sustainable alternatives are becoming available. So not only looking at the profitability and at the um, you know stickiness at the customers, but also bringing in that third dimension of 
um, the sustainability. And you can only do that if you really assess the products in terms of their sustainability. Obviously, providing positive incentives, like recommending more sustainable alternatives to your consumers, um, really um, making sure that more sustainable products have a higher chance to be solved in the end. And the last very big pillar is, and we've heard about it already, is behavioral change. So really taking the consumers along onto the journey uh, some retailers put uh, 30 to 50% of their targets really onto the shoulders of the consumers and say, hey, if our consumers continue to consume meat like we consume today, we will have zero chance to reach our science-based targets, our biodiversity goals, our health goals. So I think really tackling behavioral change uh, is a key component uh, in, in, in that whole uh, story. Um, and yeah, what do you need to do? I mean, it all again, again comes back um, to the data topic. I really love how uh, Manuel is talking about the digital twin in terms of the customers, but also the digital twin of the products. I think this summarizes it very well. You need to get a deep understanding of the consumers, but you also need to get a deep understanding of your products, um, not only to be able to provide more transparency, but also to be able to provide the right customer, the right product at the right time. Um, I also see that regulators and consumers will really increasingly require the retailers and the brands to understand inside out what they put onto the shelves. Also from that perspective, a high need to really understand what you're selling. Um, I think at the moment, some retailers are still like collecting on a very high level, you know, declarations from suppliers, uh, trying to piggyback onto their suppliers uh, goal achievable process. I don't think that will work in the long run. Um, so these are really the steps that you get the basis right, that you understand really where, where you're standing with your products and then uh, continuously improve and move forward. Cool, thank you, Marcus. I'm very thrilled because I see a lot of questions popping up, some of them even going as a direct message. So I think the discussion is really interesting for everyone. So what I hear from you, Marcus, is, uh, I mean, it is it is a complex problem. There are opportunities, but one key aspect, and I think it's probably the most important aspect of the first step of the assessment is data. And I also, we heard this a little bit from Pons at the very beginning. So data is super important and you need to have the right data uh, specific enough in order to have an accurate assessment. And my question to you, Manuel, you did uh, M-check. What kind of data sets did you use? Did you use category average or did you rather use product specific data? And did you see any limitation in using one or the other? Can you tell us more about this? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, we need to start it somewhere. So at the moment we have a category uh, specific um, data. So that means that we, for example, if you look at uh, like a pizza or a to let's like take a tomato. So what happens right now is that we try to, to average or based on a category, give the star rating. It makes it a little bit easier to start. It has also a little bit the, the limitation. Um, for example, if uh, the, the factory is using like a fossil fuel heated greenhouse or have um, like a traditional way to, to heat it up or then we have maybe an open field approach this will be at the moment the same rated so whenever somebody is really doing much more for their products this will at the moment not be because we have a category specific approach mm -hmm. but we still believe that this is something we can really start it because it helps already to differentiate for example between plant-based or cow milk uh, differentiation. So it is a start. And for sure, in the future, we will try to get much more directly data. We at the moment integrated all the systems together so that we have a much more accurate uh, data set. And the question was also that if this is a, who is doing that and where is it verified? So we are working with uh, Indeep and Trees together, for example, for the whole um, uh, uh, climate specific thing and it's validated for example by the my climate foundation so this is like an independent validation field this is for sure very very important and for example by the animal welfare we, we work together with the university in Bern, who does uh, like a specific algorithm to do that but i think in the future in the long run the whole the whole approach will be much more like in a twin uh, thinking enriched with a lot of data sets 
to do that. Um, and we also set like the science-based targets. And at the moment, they are also on category. So we started there and we will then enrich to, to go in this way. Thank you. I think it's a, a, a challenge that a lot of retailers face. They think they have to be perfect immediately. And actually you can just start and improve and improve and simply improve. And um, thanks for sharing, uh, sharing this. And I could totally relate to your example of the tomato. I mean, as a consumer, uh, I always uh, struggle in the winter when I see the tomatoes from Austria and I'm thinking, should I take this or is it better to take the tomato from Spain? And I think providing guidance uh, for consumer in the stores or at any different touch point is really crucial. So maybe once you work, uh, I mean, you implement customer centric solutions. So what could we do to um, what could we do to um, basically implement those product environmental footprint into uh, the customer journey? Yeah, certainly. Um, I, I think Manuel's raised a few interesting points um, of how they've gone about it, and I think our process is normally, shall we say, we work very customer centric. But what we do is. There's so much data in this respect. There's so much data that you need to have a good team of data analysts that is able to make a first pass at it. And maybe, and as Manuel said, you can do it by category. Uh, there's some benchmarking numbers uh, because if you star rate, what's your benchmark or what do you benchmark it against? Um, we're not so much in in using digital twins yet. We're more like what we call intelligent um, control towers. So we look more at a combination of machine learning and AI at scale. Uh, and again, not many companies are able to do AI at scale. But if you if you're able to do that, um, you then build a base for the twin because you the the, the, the twin and what you uh, develop as a continuous improvement program on that, as we mentioned. So you have a base uh, and then you start improving, you add more data or you start changing your suppliers or, or the way the suppliers feed you. So those that, that requires a good operating model to start with. And once you have that good operating model that has a, a solid foundation, then you start looking at digital twins and start seeing if you can change your network, you can change suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. So I think uh, Migro is a bit ahead of the game in that sense, because I think most retailers will be more thinking about, okay, how do I shift the right data? What benchmarks can I use and how can I communicate at best with consumers? So although from a data and technology perspective, I think we would be able to support most retailers in, in making those decisions and making those shifts. Um, it then comes back again to that communication with consumers. And as I mentioned, um, uh, Emmanuel said it himself, do you use QR codes? Can people have a lookup function? Because just seeing five stars will not be good enough for some people because they want to know what these stars mean and for where do they come from? And if a competitor of a Migro starts communicating five stars, but if I have two products that look the same to me and they have different star ratings, I will get confused as a consumer. So we will go into that with marketing teams uh, with customer experience teams, et cetera. So it's, it's, it's an end-to-end -end approach if you really want to get it right. And unfortunately, there are examples previously, and I mentioned them with, with uh, getting uh, information on, on food about allergies or on, on, on fat content or sugar content. So there are examples, but I'm afraid that sometimes we go through the same uh, movements again. And I saw in the... Um, uh, in the chat, one question from, uh, I think it was Marcus, uh, about France and, and what will be, do I think there will be industry initiatives as well. I know in Germany as well, there are some developments on, on creating a standard for labels. Um, and that I, I, it's good that there are always innovators and people running ahead of the game like Migro is because they will start pushing the shift, but ultimately the others need to follow and need to agree to 
something that consumers will see as consistent uh, across the board. Yeah. I totally agree with you and I will it's perfect that you mentioned the question because it's going to be the first question that I will answer. Uh, so Franz is right, there are quite some labels out there and I think uh, Marco uh, is asking the question here, I'm going to read it. At the moment there's still a lot of uncertainties about how to measure the impact of product and how to communicate to consumer. For example, in France a mandatory sustainability label is currently on the horizon. How should retailers and brand deal with this situation? So maybe Manuel, do you think that a retailer today should just wait, see, see what happens, or should take the risk to take action in the fog? What's your opinion? Absolutely. I mean, Migro has over 100,000 people. We are like a cruise ship, right? And I think all of us that works every in a big corporate or in a big retail know how how much effort it takes to just uh, change something. So this is uh, this is really I mean to have something like an AM check or to go into sustainability. To, you know how hardly it is. I mean this is a team of data guys, consumer guys, product guys. And this has everything played together. So I would say the sooner even you make maybe some mistakes, the sooner you start to learn at, at, at something like such an important topic, the better it is. And this is why we also started with a very simple approach. And also this simple approach, to, to be honest, is still a lot for the consumers. This is confusing the confused consumers sometimes because the Nutri-Score is also on the same product, for example. We have like from a nat nature yogurt, we have maybe 40 different uh, products from the same category, right? So mm -hmm. I think that we don't underestimate or we always a little bit underestimate the complexity of certain products because we are all in a bubble. We're all already in the sustainability field. And this is why we, we, we broadly think about running a podcast, having like a little articles, stories. Or a webinar. <laughs> or a webinar. Because one of the most important thing is really to start and also to communicate and also communicate errors. I mean, there will be certain products in Migro which have a one-star rating. And this is uh, why to, for example, have, maybe you also uh, read in the paper, that Aldi and Lidl now uh, have say that they will get rid of this um, kids, uh, bears and tigers on their packaging. So this is also a very interesting question or they get rid of all uh, flight products. So I think uh, to start and building and make an infrastructure is super important. Okay, so your take on it is retailers should start maybe make mistake but then there's always way to improve and also in order to be ahead of the game ahead of the upcoming regu uh, regulation they should start yeah i absolutely I think we all agree uh, here second question is from esther to marcus uh, let me read it so how do retailers deal with the fact that a significant number of products they sell are from third party brands where they only have limited influence and might not always be able to get the data they need. What can they do, Marcus? Yeah, that's a very big uh, and important topic um, for uh, our grocery retail clients that obviously not everyone is in the, let's say, lucky position like Migro that they have, you know, 80% of the product are private label brands, but many have uh, products from a brands and um, the approach that we uh, take here is really to start with, we call it product impact estimate. It's basically an approach where we leverage the public data that's there to accurately um, estimate the composition of the product and then um, apply, we call it performance class E data. So it's like realistic worst case assumptions in terms of the processes and in terms of the ingredients being used and just come up with a, with a high level estimate that very likely is a little bit worse off than the product does in reality, but basically gives already the retailer some, um, you know, basic uh, means to introduce the carrot and stick that I have uh, mentioned earlier. So if they can, as a retailer, you can then say, hey, dear suppliers, either we get a more 
a detailed assessment of your product and we can really you know uh, evaluate it based on the actual ingredients and the country of origin and so on or you know we're gonna uh, publish those estimates retailers could obviously also work with average values uh, however, working with average values has a little bit the downside that then you're incentivizing 50% of your suppliers who are below average to not even think about getting started uh, with improving their product because they're anyway rewarded with way better uh, CO2 value, for example, than um, you know they actually should be. So I think we only recommend to start with average values if you have a clear plan and also communicate a timeline when you will uh, transition towards this more kind of realistic worst case assumptions, but give the, the, the suppliers time to really improve their products and to be able to become more transparent about what's within their product. Um, I think retailers can take steps like recommending more sustainable alternatives actively from the assortment, um, where really those brands that are transparent and that thereby have a better rating in terms of sustainability are rewarded because they're put in front of the uh, consumers. Um, require sustainability assessments of products before being listed is a very important way how you can really show the producers and the A brands as well that you are serious about wanting to shift your uh, revenue mix towards these products that help you to achieve your climate targets, your social goals, and much more. And I think that's one important message which brands ultimately will get. Um, and yeah, what we also see is that retailers are currently starting to look into replacing a certain percentage of products every year, as I mentioned earlier, where more sustainable alternatives can be found, as well as obviously like Miko and others starting to do now to really start with the labeling, like communicating to the consumers which products are already quite sustainable and which are not. And these are all steps that have to build onto each other. It has to be that combination of carrot uh, and stick. Um, and um, yeah, these are steps that really help that the A brands get the message that they start moving into becoming a bit more transparent and uh, also obviously work on the sustainability aspects of their products. Yeah, thank you. I think this idea of somehow putting putting pressure on the one who don't want to be transparent is the right approach. And on the other side, valuing the one who are providing data by giving in a way a better score, I think it's it's definitely the right approach. Um, Heinz is asking Manuel. Manuel is the one billion one million dollar question. So I hope you're ready. Does Migro have feedback from consumer on the MCheck initiative? Do consumers look at the label? Do they select product with that filter in mind? And does your data show a sales uplift? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's a that's a good good question. Of course, we monitor that heavily. It's uh, what we can also say whenever you look at Wikipedia. I don't know who from you loves Wikipedia. So whenever product, you can go to Wikipedia and really discuss. So we have like a, a lot of consumers daily give us feedback on our product. So this is also a very good way to get any, any feedback. And for sure, we get a lot of things going on with uh, the star rating. And we see that this is a high demand. It also shifts now from, you have to see that retailers like Migro are old dinosaurs in the retail field. So they have to change now from brick and mortar to more online and in online the consumer they know from different channels like Salando and so on that they can go through every specific data so you can really see for example from a fashion brand where is it come from which color does it have and this shift is for retailers um, also something they have now to to go so we see um, very interesting discussions going on with the star rating for sure there is also the uh, the thing that we should increase the dimensions. This is also something is used, but there is also consumer that say it's too complicated. You get, you make it too much simple. <laughs> there is more information that we can have. Yes, that's also something. And yeah, we see also some interesting things going on in uh, in sales. I mean, for Migro, 
all of these aspects is uh, getting to a more eco-consciousness share, market share. So for us, it's really important. We all believe that there will be a change. So consumers will more and more demand such certain thing. Also regulatories will come. Maybe on this point on regulation, I'm also heavily believed that we should not over-report everything because none of us would like to make 300 pages of reporting for certain projects. So it should be fun and we should do something, right? And not uh, uh, just um, monitoring on that one. But uh, this will be very interesting. I can tell you much more in maybe uh, one or two years how that really, really improves on, on uh, this AM check. I won't forget, uh, Manuel. I invite <laughs> you in one that. year, believe me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, but also, Eins is asking another question to you. Um, are the data behind M checked independently verified? So, mm -hmm. it's, uh, mm -hmm. do you have a lot of scientific advisors, or how do you make sure your data are correct? Yeah, this is this is uh, what I told uh, with this uh, trees and indep. That's two uh, association or companies which helping us in that one. And there is the My, My Climate Foundation, which is well known in, in Switzerland. So this is an independent foundation. We have nothing to, to deal with them on, on this one. So they are independent. And on the other hand, we are really working with the university. So for us, this is a, a huge topic to have that independent verified. And I mean, this is where I believe in Oco and, and guys like you are coming into field at the end. This is not a single play for Migro, right? To go in this uh, field, to have these uh, ratings. For us, we are always thinking into an ecosystem as we are, are a cooperative. It's in our DNA to do uh, this in an ecosystem play. So I think there should be somebody who really can put the data together and even if you jump to another retailer which i also have here you see that's i'm not only migro there is scope ah. so uh, so we are working together this is not um something i think the age of the ecosystem will also coming much more into play now yeah and i to i totally resonate with that because if we want to solve the climate crisis it's one single person we need to manage. so we need really to do this alliance and this cooperation so i will let you have a sip of water manuel so my next question uh from yanis will go to you franz um hi franz do you think that the wide wide number of labels that are out there could potentially confuse consumers and lead to redundancy An interesting question um uh, i I don't think I completely understand the link with redundancies, but let me first try to answer the labels. I think um, it's, I've learned over time that it's wrong to assume that the consumer is stupid. They will yeah. find a way to get to the right information if they're interested. Um, so if they really want, they will do that. And those are the consumers that will be the first to make decisions on which labels to trust and not to trust and could have um, either a detrimental impact on a retailer uh, who doesn't provide good information. Um, and it could have a positive effect for others that are much better at providing that information. So in that sense, uh, I, I do think that a wide number of labels is more the risk for the retailers than it is for the consumers. Uh, I trust the consumers more than the retailers, which is maybe not fair to say, but um, I, I think providing wrong information has never worked to the advantage of, of, a, of a company. Um, I, can all, I, I saw a question above, which is related as well from Francisca about um, how can retailers and brands benefit from, from this? Um, I, I think there is, uh, as I said, if consumers trust what's there on the information, it, it will allow one retailers to, and I've said that in, in uh, I put that in the two slides I had, there's an opportunity for them also to reduce sometimes their uh, assortment in certain products. Uh, I've seen with due to the economic crisis in particular, I've seen it in with UK retailers, I don't know exactly on all the continental ones, but there has been a reduction of assortment over the recent months. Um, 
to become more efficient, to drive cost out of the business, etc. Uh, clearly, as Manuel said, we have if you get a, a, a product with a, a star rating of one, uh, you get almost a natural selection. Um, and and the question is if brands with a with a product with a star rating of one will will survive. Uh, so it will trigger interest. It will trigger financial benefits. Um, and also, uh, the diff it, it can become a differentiator for certain groups of consumers. And let, let's make sure it will be not all consumers, but those consumers with a key interest. Uh, it could lead to attrition for one retailer and for growth of another. And I, I'm not entirely sure if I answered it correctly, Janice, in terms of redundancies. Uh, but you can see the ones that will lose out will have redundancies, but the other ones will grow. So what the net effect will be, um, yeah, that's a bit early to say, but if that answers the question. And I think I would like to add to uh, Franz what you just said in terms of the financial benefits. Um, I think the a key benefit that I really see is that lots of grocery retailers are quite strong within with their private label friends, uh, private label assortment when it comes to organic products, when it comes to plant-based products. So they have a quite high market share in that space. And every consumer who really understands more about the impact of the food products and who understands more about what uh, you know impact their choices have is a consumer who will buy more vegetarian, vegan, plant-based um, or organic products, which naturally leads to the situation that um, the retailers see a revenue, a shift away from, on average, not so sustainable third-party brand products towards the assortment of their um, more sustainable white label brand products. I think this is a key financial driver that really creates a win-win situation, win-win-win situation for the retailers, for the consumers, as well as for the environment. Um, as well as, and Franz, you mentioned it already, and Manuel as well, really this opportunity to win market shares amongst those eco-conscious consumers. Yeah. More and more young people really want to take action and they understand that their everyday choices, that they are voting with their purse every day for the planet they want to live on. And they want to support companies that allow them to make smarter choices. And to also what you showed earlier was uh obviously 100 in line with uh, where we are heading in terms of engagement that you provide them with feedback how sustainable was their purchase over the course of last month Absolutely. offering them improvement recommendation and much more yeah that's that that's exactly this engagement is so important because what do we have mm. at the moment as a topic often the cons we have a, a, an unbalance of consumers are asking us what do we do with plastic bags what do we do with recycling but on the other hand when you look at really the impact this does versus your whole food eating behavior supply chain this is the much bigger topic that's why i think we need to really communicate uh, a new way and on a fun way and uh, mm. to give this um, good data and also it's like an iceberg i mean if you look what what uh, retailers are doing behind to really make that like hydrogen buses electrification and so on right that's a, a huge play that has to be invested um, to do that at the forefront um, but let's start <laughs> yeah it's good that you say that it's starting is important and starting small Surely. steps um, always right it's, it's an agile mm -hmm. world but also to recognize this is an end-to-end -end problem or issue it needs to be tackled as a whole um I, I, and you mentioned you're going into online but we we develop quite a few online uh systems for our clients and and we did one for a, a a major European retailer a few years ago, um, and it the the run at the website was fantastic. The only thing what they hadn't done was keep the supply chain in line with that increase in volume. So they then suffered a, a whole attrition rate because it was not an end-to-end -end solution. And in this, especially with sustainability, it is an end-to-end -end impact. So bear that in mind as well the, the communication with the consumer and what you need to do internally it's very important and that's why uh, marcus i said in the beginning being able to do the same online 
in tails or post systems, on labels, on products itself, in other communications is ever so important. Yeah. And maybe just to close this uh, chat, I have, it's my question, I didn't write it, but does it also have an impact on employee? Is it just on consumer or do you see also um, impact on employee engagement? Maybe Manuel or Marcus? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the biggest challenge uh, we have at the moment is really uh, this lack of talents. So, I mean, that's for every big corporate. We have at least two or 300 open positions uh, alone in technology, right? So we don't find a lot of experts. Uh, this is a huge topic. And for we have a lot of, of people coming to us because we do, like an Amchik, mm -hmm. because we do uh, plant-based, like we love, because we do commercials on that and take it seriously. And I think um, maybe it's one of the most important steps also to to really do it for employee experience um, yeah. this is uh, very very important um, uh, to start with your home base yeah i can totally sign up to that i think more and more not only young but also experienced people want to work for a company that's part of the solution instead of working for a company that's part of the problem and that even creates you know that that that's one of the key pain points of large corporates large organizations at the moment where do i get my talented uh, employees who really keep the company moving and um, this yeah it's a key reason why uh, grocery retailers uh, are moving into that direction because they want to clearly show to their own employees and to potential employees that they are very transparent that they are part of the solution and that they are uh, enabling their them as employees to do something work on something meaningful and um, that's something we benefit a lot from at Inoko, when we are looking for developers, it's usually quite easy um, to find people. And we are very unique here because everyone else finds it really hard. Uh, so I really know from our own experience that um, it's really the case that people want to work for a company that's part of the solution. And I think that should be uh, a big reason also why uh, retailers and brands become more transparent and really uh, lead the way in this space. So please write me on LinkedIn when you search something, right? <laughs> or Inoko or France. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, from All my right. pers from my perspective, maybe a quick one. I think um, it is very important for employees to identify with the culture of their company uh, in under any circumstances. Uh, we know a, a very easy example is there's lots of people that don't want to work with cigarette companies, mm. right? There will be lots of companies or lots of people that don't want to work for a company that does not do anything for the environment. Uh, so I think it is important if you have a mindset in a company and you want to really get your, uh, your own employees on, on, on board is to be consistent with that again. And, 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 and you will see that they will go out of their way to support your course. Perfect. Thank you, everyone. We are uh, absolutely perfectly on time. Uh, it was really great to talk to the three of you. And uh, also thank you to everyone who asked your question. Unfortunately, some questions were not answered, but it's certainly not the last webinar that we are organizing. So um, please stay tuned and uh, we will have the, probably the chance at the next webinar to answer them. Thank you, Alain. Thank you for moderating. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good job. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.